talk about. Hub. She's quite poor. Hello and welcome, my name is Ian and this channel is all about music and art and in this series of videos we've been looking at what is happening regarding the music streaming in the UK. The UK Government's Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee have been looking into the ways that streaming platforms and large record companies manage payments to songwriters, musicians and performers. And on the 15th of October 2020, Parliament published a news article stating that the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Committee were going to inquire into the impact of the streaming on the future of the music industry. This article stated that the inquiry would consider whether the government should take action to protect the industry from piracy in the wake of steps taken by the EU on copyright and intellectual property rights. Now I knew that some high profile musicians and music industry types were going to be giving evidence to the committee. And the first of these meetings was on the 24th of November 2020. And it continued through December into January and February of this year, 2021. Now these were long meetings lasting over three hours. So what I've done is I've edited them all down into shorter videos and you can find a link to all the previous meeting videos in the description down below. I've also created an introduction for each section and if you want to, you can skip straight past those bits to the questions by clicking on the timestamps. Again, all of this stuff is in the description. So in this video, we'll look at the session from the 23rd of February, 2021. And I thought it would be worth providing a short background to the witnesses giving evidence. So in this evidence session, we have Paul Firth from Amazon, Horatio Guitares from Spotify, and Elena Siegel from Apple Inc. Paul Firth took on the role of director of Amazon Music and National Responsible for Non-US Territories in 2017. His previous position was as director of Amazon Music Europe. London-based, Firth has worked at Amazon for nearly 10 years, starting off as head of buying for music and MP3s at Amazon Music in 2011. Next, we have Horacio Guitares, who is a Spotify's general counsel and vice president of business and legal affairs. Based at Spotify USA's headquarters in New York City, Horatio is responsible for overseeing Spotify's global legal, regulatory and government affairs and serves as corporate secretary to its board of directors. And lastly, we have Elena Siegel, a wide respected figure in music industry circles. Elena was appointed as Apple's Music's first ever global director of music publishing in 2018. She's a qualified lawyer, originally joined Apple in 2006 after four years as an associate at a Los Angeles-based law firm. As legal director of iTunes International, she oversaw a range of legal and licensing matters for iTunes and Apple Music. And in 2015, she headed up global licensing for the launch of Apple Music itself. All sessions were shared by Julia Knight and the complete list of committee members and relevant links are in the description down below. This recording is made in agreement with the UK Parliament's terms and conditions, which state that I cannot alter the video or audio in any way. I can't use the material for satire or use it on a website or social media platform that promotes, encourages and facilitates illegal activity or encourage hatred and antisocial behaviour. So here is part two of the session from the 23rd of February 2021 into the economics of music streaming. Uh, Mr. Mr. Firth, we haven't forgotten about you. Um, <laughs> uh, you'll be very glad to know. Um, I just want to put a question to you. I, I put it to previous panels. Um, we know musicians take take risk. They to follow their dreams and their ambitions. They may uh, go around Europe in a in a, a dodgy old van, and they uh, they obviously you know will accept the fact that in order to to have their music played, to have their music catch on, they're going to have to invest their time and their emotions and maybe perhaps give up other career as a result. We know that record labels uh, take risk, particularly with new talent. And we know that there's only a percentage of that new talent that actually sort of hits off for them. And they will very rarely reclaim uh, lost money that they've paid out in order to promote someone else's career. What risk do you take as a streaming service? 
Well, first of all, thanks for inviting me along and for the opportunity to contribute to this important inquiry. Uh, and thank you for, for coming to me with that question. Um, I, I think this is an interesting one. I, I really um, appreciate the, the point you make. I think there is risk being taken by musicians and, of course, by record labels too, but there is also risk being take, by, taken by any streaming service that launches into this very competitive market segment. Um, you know, we do have to ad, uh, invest in advance to build a great customer experience, as Eleanor was saying earlier, although most of us have the same catalogue or thereabouts. Um, you, know, you really need three things to be able to build a streaming service. You need to be able to have access to the music that people want. You have to invest in marketing so people understand your streaming service and what's different about you. And you have to invest in the customer experience. It's the customer experience that people end up paying for. It's the customer experience that we built as streaming services that have persuaded people to pay for music again when they were previously accessing it through file sharing prices, uh, sites or through piracy. So really, it's about the advanced investments that we have to make to build those streaming services at scale, to build that customer experience and to keep up with the ever increasing customer demand. So we're investing ahead uh, and we're taking some risk in that as well. Yeah, but to say this, as, as a, uh, you know, Spotify obviously launched, I think, 11 years ago. Um, and you obviously are more, a more recent entrance into the market, obviously a giant global brand. A lot of the work was already sort of, you know, people understood the idea of music streaming and they understood that side of the marketing. So why is it that streaming services feel as if they should take 30%? Well, the, the 30% is about in line with what we've always taken as a retailer. So when we sell CDs and vinyl, which we still do at Amazon, of course, or our download stores where we sell MP3s to people, it's a similar margin to that. I think it's quite a different work, a piece of work that we have to do in order to be able to run a streaming service. It's very focused on this customer experience that I talk about, about right? making sure that we're, put, we're building an experience that customers find delightful, that they're happy to pay for. Really, a customer will only remain a, stre an, a streaming subscriber if they enjoy the experience, if they can find the music they want quickly, easily, and are able to enjoy it. That's the way they stay a subscriber the following month and the following month. That's how we grow our business, but it's also how we grow the total amount of money that we pay into rights holders. So if there is an investment to be had there. There are other you know, more mechanical things in the background, like servers and you know, credit card fees and payments and customer service, et cetera. But really, it's the customer experience that we have to invest in, and that's where the risk sits, and that's where the majority of that investment goes. Um, is there a limit to the marketplace for, for streaming? I mean, there has been some discussion about whether or not there is a, a finite number of streams and that the current economics whether or not they're, they're, they're hitting a certain ceiling and obviously as a, a massive player you're um you 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 uh you, you would and a relatively newer entrant as well you would probably be aware of that why is it that you think that there is still space in the marketplace i'm convinced there's still space in the marketplace we we um the market segment we we launched about four and a half years ago with amazon music unlimited so we have come into this much later but we came into streaming with a different approach and that yes of course we do compete head-on for the same subscribers with other streaming services but our approach from the outset was can we take music streaming to a different group of customers can we act to try and extend the overall market segment so that more and more people can come into streaming so we can grow the overall pie as Mr. Green was saying earlier, growing the overall pie is an important, important part of this. So our view was that you can take music streaming to a much more mainstream music fan. And we would know, look, looking back at um, data from our CD and vinyl and MP3 stores, we could see that about 70% of our customers would spend £30 a year or less on music. So they were buying one, two, three albums a year, maybe. And it's quite a big step for them to go into £120 a year. So we decided to try to approach that in another way, try to move street and customers through into streaming, build a streaming service that my, you know, my nearly 18-year-old son and my 82-year-old mother-in-law would both want to use by not making it particularly for one test or another, but making it for everybody. Is this basically sort of Amazon's bid for, uh, rather cheaply here, global domination? Because obviously you have the, Prime services, your TV, your music streaming. I know that uh, we're going to touch up very shortly on smart speakers. Um, is this basically just in the same way as we've got, you know, YouTube being deemed the biggest streaming service? We've got Spotify, which obviously trailblazers, which is, is, is a huge service, but at the same time is a small player. And I think they've made reference to that. Um, why, what is the role that you see of music streaming playing within that suite of Amazon products? And what do you think that that then offers, not just to consumers, but actually what do you think it offers 
to those who create? Well, I think the um, I mean, the offer to the consumer is to make streaming really easy and accessible and to take away any friction they may have seen around whether music streaming was for them, whether it was either too hard to use or maybe it was you know, focused on genres that they didn't like. Uh, and we've entered into streaming with a view that music streaming should be for everybody. It shouldn't be just focused at a certain group who helped, you know, perhaps early adopters or people who are very tech savvy. It should be available for everybody. And that we can attract that more mainstream fan by the way in which we choose to position our service, both focusing on a customer experience that makes it really easy to use, but also thinking about what genres of music we want people to listen to, or we can help people find because they should choose what they listen to. And what we see in the results there is that Amazon Music uh, and limited subscribers are more likely to listen to rock music, more likely to listen to um, indie music, they're more likely to listen to pop, they're more likely to listen to country than the market segment as a whole when it comes to music streams. So we can see that we are bringing in a different type of customer. Why that's good for creators, of course, is it's a much broader suite of creators who can see their music being streamed on Amazon Music. It means that all types of musicians can see that this music streaming can be good for them as well. And it just brings in more money to the overall market segment. So rather than just chasing the same group of consumers, we're expanding the reach, which which hopefully, we hope, uh, grows the overall pie. You So it's not just about Ed Sheeran. Uh, it's actually about many different artists, if you like. But how is it, how is it that your offering, effectively, is enabling that to happen? Because... I mean, I can. I have some concerns. I'll be honest with you about the use of algorithms, but more generally, actually. But within this space, because I, I do wonder whether or not it narrows choice rather than increases it, and you end up doing sort of like just listening effectively to the same music all the time. Um, how is yours different? Well, I mean, actually, we 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 do use algorithms, and I'll come on. I'd, I'd love to talk about those in in a, in a moment. But first of all, we also use human curation. So we've heard from other services that they like to focus on one or the other. Well, we're doing both, and we actually do have teams of music specialists in every country. We have a team right here in London who create most of the playlists that are listened to on Amazon Music. And these are not the sort of dynamic playlists that have been mentioned before. These playlists, they're almost more like compilations albums. You can open them up, you can look through them, you can choose to start at track five. You can skip tracks as you wish. They're, they're much more interactive like that. They're, they're like, a, say, like a compilation album. And alongside yeah. so, that, so, excuse me, that, that's, that's, that, uh, pardon, Paul, that, that doesn't appear to be very different to what I've seen. I, I'm a a user of one of these streaming services and, and that exact same thing occurs with them that that effectively there are playlists there and you can go on to them they tend to be very they to be relatively similar along a similar genre or date uh, a period of time so I, I don't quite get how what you're saying there is any real different than the others surely the reason you're in it is because you're doing this sort of cross media uh, offering and that you are basically such a big player in all those other areas that effectively you can cut out your own piece of this market? Well, we, we believe we can build a meaningful business for Amazon Music Unlimited as a standalone PL. We are in it to drive it for its own business. It's not about other things that it can do for Amazon. And the reason I've mentioned playlists is, is to highlight the fact that we don't just use algorithms. We are using um, human creation. And I know you see that in other services too. And I think many people take different approaches to this. Is how you choose what to program. Is whether or not you choose to program for a particular type of genre, whether you want to program for all genres, whether you highlight music from certain genres. That's how we've thought about it. Make this accessible to everybody. And we do use algorithms. And we use algorithms with really one aim in mind, and that aim is to give a great customer experience. As I've said before, you know, we believe strongly that a great customer experience means that subscribers are more likely to come back again next month. They're more likely to pay again. We will grow and uh, we'll pay more money into rights holders. So algorithms are there not for any sinister reason at all, but just to drive great, uh, you know, great customer experience and to play you what we think you want to listen to based on what you've told us about what you like from what you've listened to already. So that's the only reason that algorithms are there. I know one particular type of algorithm playback has come a few times from, from committee members. It's what we would call autoplay. So that's when you can play an album, and then at the end of the album, we may play you something else based on what you've been listening to. Now, that um, we're able to measure that. One of the advantages of having lots of customers listening to lots of music is that you can measure the impact of everything you do. So we can measure at a total level, does that mean that customers stay longer when they listen to autoplay? And we can show that it does. But we also recognise it's not for everybody. 
So we've made it possible in settings for you to turn that off. So if you want to go into your settings in Amazon Music, you can turn off autoplay. So if some customers don't like that, we give the, we put the power into the customer's hands to be able to change the way the overall service works. Okay, thank you. Heather Wheeler. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I've got a question for um, Amazon and Apple, so uh, Paul and Elena, and, and thank you very much for coming this afternoon. Or is it morning where you are? Sorry, yes. Um, so both of your companies develop smart, um, smart speakers and, and voice assistants. <clears throat> so what I'm interested in finding out, please, is are your streaming services the default streaming services on your speakers? Uh, and if so, do you think that that is um, going to give you a, a competition uh, implication and maybe infringements on that? Don't mind who goes first. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to go go here, and it's uh, it's an afternoon for me as well. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, the first thing to say is that so I work in the Amazon music business. Um, our Alexa and devices teams are run entirely independently, uh, and that's important actually because Alexa is a voice service that does work with many streaming services. So it's important that I can't see all the things that that Alexa team do. In fact, uh, both Apple and Spotify are available on Alexa, as are some other streaming services. We make it very clear to people who buy a device, buy, buy an Echo speaker in particular, um, that other streaming services are available. It's even listed on the outside of the box. And when they set their device up, they're able to choose which streaming service they set as their default. Uh, and one of those options is Amazon Music, of course. Now, I will say that if a customer does not set their default and they ask their Alexa to play some music, then there will be a fallback option that does mean in that case, we'll play Amazon Music because we're focused on giving that customer a great customer experience. But we'll also make it very clear to them by what Alexa says to them that we are playing them Amazon Music just to ensure that they haven't done so by mistake. So we want to make sure that Alexa is available for use with all streaming services. We think that's what gives the very best customer experience. Oh, you, Heather, you're on mute. Yeah, Elena, please. Um, well, very similar answer to Paul, actually. Uh, our HomePod division is, is also completely separate from, from music. And similarly to, to what Paul said, you can you can use Apple Music um, on HomePod, but you can also use other third-party services on HomePod. And equally, you can actually use Apple Music on, on third-party uh, smart speakers. Um, so I think... You know that that all feels like very healthy competition to me. Um, I believe I believe the default initially, if you haven't told it to use a different service, is Apple Music. Um, and but that's that's changeable. Right. Thank you very much. Very clear answers. Much appreciated. Thank Cheers, you, Heather. Thank you, uh, Charles Wassling. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm, I'm looking to make amazing figures here. I'd like to speak to Horatio first, if I may. Um, I'm looking at some astounding figures. Uh, <clears throat> in April 2019, uh, Spotify reached 100 million worldwide paying subscribers. And then in the first quarter of 2020, Spotify reported that it had reached 286 million active worldwide users in total. Incredible figures. Um, but Spotify UK has been profitable since 2013. It's been, it's been doing very well. But historically, globally, you've operated at a loss. Now, how long do you expect that to continue? And to a layman like myself, how on earth is that sustainable? Well, um, you know, clearly that's a challenge. We, we are working very hard to try to break even and then um, uh, make a profit. And we believe that it is possible to do so. And we think we're on a path to do that. The way we think about it, we, you know, only yesterday we announced that we were launching in 85 new countries that we were not present in. So our performance that you're referring to and the one over the last decade is the result of how well we've done first in the European market, then in the US market, and then some of the key other markets around the world. So we are still in expansion mode. We are launching in new markets. We're finding new users. We are developing new advertising revenue generation uh, mechanisms. And then we are working very hard to convert more of those users in the ad funder tier into the, into the subscription tier. So, you know, as we have grown, because our arrangements with labels and publishers around the world are a revenue share, you know, the more the pie has grown, the more the slice for 
artists and their intermediaries has, has grown too. So the way we've look, we are looking to really expand margins is to try to bring a number of services, marketing and promotional services that artists and labels would have had to pay for outside of the service and trying to create more effective, better performing audience expansion uh, mechanisms within the service. And you may, you may also have heard that we've made significant investments in other uh, non-music audio segments, particularly podcast, which has a very different cost structure uh, that we believe has the potential uh, to really put us on a more solid path uh, towards growth. But it is clear that the cost structure of the music streaming side of the business is, is, is very challenging because um, you know over two thirds of every pound that we generate go straight to to rights holders and ultimately to the to the musicians and artists they represent. So, so it would appear from what you're saying that you're depending on and sort of an ever expanding pie to keep going, or indeed look for another pie as you have done in, in the terms of pod, pod, podcast. So, so how sensitive are your growth figures to the cost of your service? Is endless expansion the only way forward for you? Well, it's it's not just endless expansion. Uh, you know, clearly there is there are only so many countries in the world, and even though it might appear that a new one gets created every every few years, there's a limit to how many of those you can be in. But we're still growing. I think the markets, the 85 markets that we announced yesterday, have a represent an addressable market of about a billion uh, new users. So that is there is significant headway in our ability to grow there. But that market expansion is not our only margin expansion strategy. As I said, we're, we're trying to bring new services, new tools, both that users can take advantage of, but also that creators uh, can use. We, we think of ourselves as much as a platform for users to consume music as we think of ourselves as a platform that can provide tools for artists to really understand where their audience is what they react to, how to help structure their, their live tours, what is resonating in what market. And those insights are insights that were not there before the advent of, of these technologies, which can be super useful in the planning and development of an artist's career. All of, the, all of that is very laudable, and I, and I absolutely support you in that. But you, do you, from just a pure business point of view, do you see Spotify ever becoming just sustainable on on the on the uh, on the customers that it has? Can you see that happening? Well, you, you know, we hope we're going to have more customers than the customers that we have, and that over time that we will have more services and a menu of services at different price points that that we can target to different users, right? So a company like like ours, when when you think you have tapped into a market or are close to it, what you think is how do I redefine the market to continue growing? And I expect that we will continue to do that. You saw us doing that in, in our investments with respect to podcasts. We are committed to the audio scenarios, but there are a number of, of scenarios within that that we think we can get better at. And what we can do is we, we live in a world and we compete in a world of what's called attention economics. We're competing with gaming companies. We're competing with Netflix. We're competing with all of these other things for a consumer's attention. And what we're trying to do is that when it comes to audio that a user will think of us first, and then when they're in our service, we're going to keep them there listening to music on our service, listening to content related to music, listening to podcasts, because the more engaged our users are, the longer they stay, the long-term value of that user is bigger, and that translates automatically believe, into benefit for, for everyone in the ecosystem. Believe me, this, this, this committee is very familiar with attention economics. We've uh, looked into that in various uh, ways before. Um, so you don't, you don't foresee a sort of a dot-com bubble type thing bursting. You, you, you think that there is room for ever expansion, it would say. But I, I'd like to move on very quickly to, um, I mean, is, is the cost of music? i.e. payment to artists, songwriters, et cetera, one of the soft, softer costs you have, i.e. is it easier to uh, squeeze that area to achieve profit, for profitability? Is that for me? Yes, sorry. That was for you, Horatio, sorry. Um, so, you know, we have, 
the you know the, this notion of squeezing one area versus the other you know we have the agreements that we have in place uh in some cases they're compulsory licensing regimes and the other so uh, we really don't look at that as an opportunity for us to squeeze margin for that we look to create new opportunities to create wealth for everyone in the system and expand the pie and in the process it, it hopefully expand um our um our margins. Um, you know, we we signed and have from the beginning of the company, our determination was to launch a service only after we had deals uh, in place that respected the intellectual property rights of, of musicians and creators and, and everyone. And that's, uh, that, that's what we've done. So more than squeezing anyone in the system, we believe that because we are a connected industry and this, this this also relates to a previous answer as to the relative contribution of a label or, or another part of the equation. We're an industry. We need a number of actors in this industry. We need the songwriters and we need the performing artists and we need the managers and we need the agents and we need the tour managers and we need the labels and radio and everyone. And we are the link in the value chain that connects demand all over the world of people who we have found and we have persuaded that it makes sense to pay for music, we connect them to the content and the creators of that content. That is the value that we bring about. And the more we do that, because music is so compelling, the more we can continue to expand this pie um, and, and for the benefit of everyone, as a matter of fact, not just us. Yeah, thank you. I, I just worry that, um, like uh, theatrical producers of old, and I and I cast no aspersion. There are so many excellent theatrical producers. They rely on the absolute loyalty of their artists, and they rely on the fact that the artists are desperate to create and use that, and don't necessarily pay the money they should really be getting to to really expand that creation in in future. But I'd like to move on now to Elena, if if, if I may, uh, Ellen. Sorry. Uh, you know, we've had uh, several stakeholders have said to us that app stores like uh, Apple and Google often host illegitimate streaming apps that, uh, uh, that host unlicensed music and are, here's the point, slow to remove them. How do you respond to those concerns? Well, um, I would respond by saying we have a, a large, a very large number of people whose responsibility it is to review every app before it goes up, um, check for compliance with our app store guidelines, which require that people have licenses for any music that is used. And there's a very large number of apps that do not go up uh, because they the apps are found not to comply with those guidelines. Uh, and there's also a monitoring process uh, to check that apps haven't been changed uh, without us knowing. Uh, and any update to an app gets checked as well. And then on top of that, we also have a robust uh, notice and takedown process. So, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to hit it as hard as we can from both ends. And it, it's something we, we care greatly about. Uh, and I think we're doing a great deal to, to prevent uh, a lot of harm. Yeah, well, this industry has historically suffered from piracy, even back in, in the days of uh, vinyl. Uh, and and, and, and the, the problem I see it is that now with this mass expansion that we've been talking about, this ever-expanding pie, it can do an enormous amount of damage very quickly. Uh, and I think speed of response is the issue here. Uh, do you think you're doing enough? I think we're doing as much as we can. I think it's it's very difficult for us to sit as sort of judge and jury, if, if you like. Um, we really need, if someone has a complaint, uh, we need to, we, we put them in touch with the person about whom they're complaining or the, the developer about who they're complaining um, and ask them to, to um, have some discussion between themselves because we can't just assume that you know, we, we can't just take one person's word over another. Um, and there are a lot of legitimate music apps. Um, and, you know, we, we, we can't easily determine which ones are, are good and which ones are bad. Um, are you saying that that might so, cause you to make the processes? Sorry, say, say that again? So that, 
exactly what might be causing you delay in your processes to bring these, yes. these illegitimate apps to heal. Yes. Okay, well, um, I would suggest you need to find a quicker way of, of resolving those issues. Well, it's something that we are constantly iterating on and, and looking at. Uh, you know, the App Store, as with HomePod, is outside my area of expertise. Um, and But you know, I can certainly assure you that piracy is something you know, something that we have fought against. It was, the you know, the entire genesis of the iTunes Store was, was to uh, combat piracy, essentially. Thank you, Eleanor. I think I've hit that drum enough. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, Giles. Uh, Eleanor, just, just on that point, you said that the, the point of uh, the iTunes store was to combat piracy. Obviously, it wasn't just there to make money. Um, there's a regular refrain here from, from the industry, which is effectively that, you know, that they were in real trouble. And then uh, the likes of Spotify came along and then yourselves, obviously, and I tune and now uh, Amazon are roading behind you. And you save the industry by effectively killing off piracy. Um, how long do they have to be thankful to you for? And how long do they have to pay uh, in terms of that for what you actually did 11 years ago? Well, first of all, I, uh, we're not asking anyone to be thankful to, for, to us. Um, <laughs> that, that's not something that we've ever said. Um, there's also a little bit of revisionist history that goes on because, um, you know, iTunes was founded in 2003 and came in, in the, into the UK in 2004. And that seems to sometimes get written out of history a little bit. Um, and like I said, we're not asking anyone to be grateful. We believe very strongly that creators should be paid for their art. And we have striven to do that ever since 2003 when we came into this business. Um, and I think we have gone further than anyone else in trying to ensure money flow. You know, there have been, you know, there have been numerous ways in which there were complications moving to a sort of legitimate digital world because you had lots of players who just weren't ready for it uh, in terms of sort of receiving money and, and dealing with, with the money. And we've worked really hard to push people to work with us on processes that enable money flow as best as possible to you know from us to on you know on the on the composition side for example from us to collecting societies to songwriters and um we, we've done that because we don't want to hold on to the money we want the money to get to the people that it's supposed to get to um so it's something that we've worked really hard at, and we're not asking for anyone's gratitude. We want there to be a healthy, creative ecosystem. We want creators to to be able to create. We've always said that music is in our DNA, and we really mean it. Well, I do remember when you you did launch because I had a Nano iPod at the time with two gig, a mighty two gigabytes of um, <laughs> of storage space. But of course, at that time, the only stream you could do was thirty seconds, wasn't it? Wasn't it? And then you had to pay for it. Which is yes. was obviously a very different model, and you were working. You were working at the same time as obviously had Napster and Pirate Bay. They no longer are out there. Uh, I do wonder whether or not the actions that were taken against them sort of does preclude piracy going forwards. Potentially, I don't know whether that's the case or not, but I do wonder whether that's the case. Um, YouTube, are they getting away with it? <laughs> um. Well, we, as I said earlier, it's challenging to compete with free. Um, it's always been challenging, whether it's legitimate or, or illegitimate. Um, and, you know, it's challenging to compete on a, an unlevel playing field. Um, Specifically, what's, the, what's the, the main way in which it's completely sort of an, an unlevel level playing field? What is the main way? the fact that that they don't necessarily have licenses for all of the music that they use and that they don't need to and and mm -hmm. and e even where they do have licenses the amount they pay because of the the way their business model is set up and the way the tariffs work is is less well they wouldn't actually tell us precisely how much they paid in their last session of course they nor even give us a range 
in that respect. And then they accused everyone else of, of lacking transparency. I thought I was a little bit rich. So thanks for watching. The next video will be a continuation of this session. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.